which David has just given me to remind me what I'm supposed to talk about. Um, and this is the gravitational physics review course. So this is where we go back to general relativity, but kind of build on it, sort of maybe going into a little bit more depth on some of the sort of mathematical details behind GR, though I think David gave you quite a bit. But also, as well as going back, looking forward and looking at aspects of gravity as they maybe you know, spill out into other areas of physics. So I probably, you know, given it it's a blackboard, more of a theoretical course, I'll be focusing more on things that maybe feed into ideas where gravity gets used in string theory. Some of the background to uh, some of the ideas that you will be then taken forward in the strong gravity course. So we'll be doing some background work on things like you know, the notion of gauge and general relativity, which is really important when you're doing numerical work. Um, and then we'll probably just be doing some things because I think they're fun, OK? And they've got gravity associated with them. So um, my name's Ruth Gregory. I'm based at Durham University, but I spend quite a bit of time here. So I'm here for um, a couple more months now. I'm located in office, I should have written it down, 226, in okay, case so anybody has a desperate question that they want to, to ask. The team is myself, David, and Finn Gray. So um, we're, we're going to take you through your gravity journey. And just to be difficult, um, I use the opposite metric signature to David. So you could imagine what our collaborations are like. There's usually a battle as to who writes the paper and who gets the signature first. Um, and I've just put down there the, the conventions that I use. And I noticed sort of, you know, when I was saying, oh, h bar equals c equals 1, you're probably quite used to seeing that. But when I wrote that down, it sort of made me think that, you know, we, we, get, we see this when we're learning sort of field theory or gravity for the first time. And you may often see setting g equal to 1 as well, which I won't do. Um, without necessarily sort of explaining why we do that and what the impact is. So setting C equals 1 is saying that we are not interested so much in everyday scales. We're interested in very large distances or very short times. So that's particularly useful in cosmology, for example, when you're thinking of the universe as a whole. But you'll notice, I guess because you did cosmology first, that it also leads to things like the equation of state for matter saying that pressure is zero. So obviously, pressure of everyday matter isn't zero. But you know, by thinking of E equals mc squared, the pressure compared to the energy content of an ideal gas is zero. So setting units to one tells you something about the scales you're looking at. Although we won't really be having an h-bar much in this course, um, I'm going to set it to one more because of dimensional analysis. In the end, I just want, want one dimensional parameter, and that's going to be Newton's constant. The reason I haven't set that to one, and um, sort of probably the generation of relativists, relativists before me would have, is because I'm going to be a little bit more agnostic about the number of dimensions that we're doing gravity in. And so the gravitational constant is now dimension full. And in four dimensions, it has the dimensions of L squared. In five dimensions, L cubed, et cetera, et cetera. And it's actually important if, you're, if you've got a higher dimensional space that you're sort of reducing down to four dimensions, if you don't do it at the Planck scale, it gives you a hierarchy between Newton's constants. So that's why I'm not setting g equal to 1. So I thought it was just useful to put down our <clears throat> sort of canonical mass, length, and time scales, which is the Planck scale. Um, simply just to sort of give us a sense of what we're doing. So our Planck mass, we always put the, oh, well, I will be putting the eight pi's in, hopefully consistently. The Planck mass is around 10 to the 18 GV. And when we come to talking about systems in gravity, black holes, our mass is going to be way bigger than that. 
So it's one of these confusing things and you know, field theory thinking about small masses, but in gravity we're thinking about big masses so that our curvature scale is small. We want to stay well away from the Planck scale. I'm not doing quantum gravity, okay? That's a different course if it's still going on. So, um, again, Planck length, 10 to the minus 35 metres, and the Planck time, 10 to the minus 44 seconds. So these are the key scales when you're thinking about gravity and where, where you want gravity to be applicable is at curvatures which are well longer than this Planck scale, times longer than the Planck time, masses bigger than the Planck mass. So that's sort of the regime that we're going to be playing in. Right, having put a little bit of physics down, it's now going to go to mathematics. So in order to describe what we mean by gravity. Gravity, instead of being a force, is now just a manifestation of curved space. And so, in the end, a lot of what we do in gravity is like applied differential geometry. And so, as David would have introduced, we use a, dis a mathematical description of our space-time, and that's based on the theory of manifolds. So, I'm going to start with that. Some of it is going to be stuff that you've already covered. Um, but then maybe, you know, I'll say some slightly different words. And maybe, you know, we'll, it'll go into a bit more depth <clears throat> at some point. So, So I'm going to also not be too um, formal, I guess, with the way I express things. So it's not going to be quite written as a piece of pure math. So, <clears throat> but uh, we, our manifold, our space-time consists of sets of events. So we have sort of things that happen in different places and happen at different times. And so we like to label that by saying, you know, this is the place and this is the time. But sort of abstractly, they're all just sets of different points, different events, and locally they look like R to the N. So what that means is we've got our sort of general blob, which is the manifold. We've got our standard Euclidean or Lorentzian, but flat space-time, and locally to a point, we can take a neighbourhood of a point and map it to some neighbourhood in R to the N. So that's our sort of standard idea locally. And then we've got the notion that if we have two overlapping, two different points with overlapping neighbourhoods, with two different maps, then... going to be slightly sloppy and call them by their coordinate labels, then on the overlap, the transformation between this correspondence from the manifold to R to the N and this one is infinitely differentiable. Now, it doesn't have to be, but we are interested in differentiable manifolds. Now I'm going to have trouble spelling this.
So this is our notion. We have our, our sort of blob, which is the manifold. In any given region, we can always find a little patch that goes down to r to the n, our flat space. That's called a chart. So this thing is a chart. The collection of all charts is an atlas. And of course, on an overlap, we have a, we could either go via the top, tr top chart or the bottom chart, but we're going to ask that on an overlap, this transformation from chart, chart sort of unprimed to prime chart is infinitely differentiable. So that's our local transformation. X mu goes to X primed, mu primed. That's infinitely differentiable. So I know you've seen that. <clears throat> and then we want to paint some structure on our manifold. So I'm just going to build this up piece by piece. So we look at functions on the manifold. So I think David called these scalars. So we call this our set of functions on the manifold C infinity of M. So this is the collection of all infinitely differentiable functions on M. And what do we mean by that? Well, we, our function is just a map from the manifold into the reals. So we take, let's say, a point, x mu goes to f of x mu. And when we say infinitely differentiable, we kind of mean where we are always translating to our local chart, locally in r to the n. So we use charts. to define differentiability. <clears throat> so that's taking our manifold and mapping it to the reals. We can go the other way around. So we can take a little segment of the reals, a, say some interval, and we map it on to some curve on the manifold. So that's the idea. It's sort of all very visual. So we could also write this as x mu of t. And again, this is meant to be infinitely differentiable. So an example of a curve might be the world line of an observer, and then t would be like the, their time. So obviously, curves are quite an important notion in terms of the physics that we might be thinking of doing on our manifold. <clears throat> but the reason why they're important mathematically, let's see if I can get this to work, is that curves allow us a definition of vectors.
So a vector in, in this abstract sense is defined as an operator which is we would interpret visually or geometrically as being a tangent to a curve, but it's an operator which maps C infinity of M to C infinity of M at every point. So what it does is, at a point P, a vector <clears throat> is going to, it's sort of associated, if you like, <clears throat> associated to the curve gamma, the vector takes any, you take any function of f, sorry, any function f in C infinity of m, and it takes that f to the derivative of f at the point p. So here we've got our manifold. We've got our curve gamma. We've got a point p. Actually, let me make it bigger. So here's our point P. Now, if we have a function in C infinity of M, although that's a function on the manifold, we can also restrict it to the curve gamma. And so that gives us an F of T. And then once we've got an F of T, we just do real analysis and take df dt. But this has to be true for all functions. And so what that means is you get this concept of T as being a tangent vector. So that's how we interpret it geometrically or visually. So formally it's an operator, but from a pictorial point of view, it really is this tangent to the curve. So these operators, so we've started off by defining it as an operator, <clears throat> so they form a vector space that's kind of anchored at that point P. If we had a different curve, gamma primed, we would have a different tangent vector, let's say S. So that gives us two different operators at the point. And then at least locally to P, we could project down onto a chart and kind of construct a third curve, gamma 3, that was like the sum of gamma and gamma primed. And that would give us an, a vector S plus T. So to form a vector space, we need a sort of rule of addition. And we need to be able to multiply our vectors by a scalar. And all we do for that is to simply go along our curve, either twice as fast, half as fast, et cetera, to get our vector changing in scale. So that's the idea. So it forms a vector space at P, and this is called the tangent space. Tp of m. 
So it's the tangent space of the manifold at a point P. And then, of course, you can compose, find tangent spaces at every individual point, and that gives you the tangent bundle. So the collection of tangent spaces gives us a slightly different notion of vectors, um, but one which I think corresponds to our intuitive idea of what a vector is. So we kind of start off by learning of vectors as being something with a magnitude of direction. We then <clears throat> move on and discover that vectors really are just some space that satisfies certain axioms of addition and multiplication by a field and usually a real scalar. Um, and then, in differential geometry, we kind of come full circle to this notion of direction and magnitude again. And so that's really what our vectors are. <clears throat> Interestingly, when we would first meet vectors, because we're doing them on flat space, R cubed, we don't get this distinction between vectors and covectors. Um, but if we, because we have a dot product in R cubed, but a dot product, you know, as you're aware from GR, is really just a notion of a distance function or a metric, and we want to be a bit more general, although most of the time I'm actually going to assume we have a metric. A lot of what I'm saying now does not presuppose that, okay? So at the moment, the only structure I've really assumed is infinite differentiability here, and that we have a manifold. So covectors <clears throat> are maps from a tangent space to the reals. So we may call it. So let's, I usually call my vectors with with Roman indices and covectors with Greek ones, as a rule. So a covector is going to be a map from the vector space into the reals. So if you think about it, when you do a dot product, if you were to sort of separate off the A dot B, the process A dot is like an operator that takes the second vector and gives you a scalar. So it is, in this sense, it's a map from the vectors into the reals. <clears throat> So there's two sort of possible notations that you can use, if, which is really restricted more to the first part of this course. But because I'm not yet, I'm sort of keeping things abstract and geometric, omega acts on V. So you could say it's omega of V to emphasize like omega's acting on it as a map. Sometimes I'll use the bra and ket. In fact, mostly I'll use the bra and ket notation, which is, again, sort of you know, it, it's sort of emphasizing that, that, if you like, this is the vector with its uh, components horizontal and this one is vertical. So, <clears throat> so in language that might be more familiar, You might be more used to seeing vectors and covectors with indices. So omega of v would be equivalent to omega mu v mu. So most when we actually come to rolling up our sleeves and starting to work with gravity, I'm going to be looking notationally on the right-hand side here. But while I'm trying to develop some of the 
sort of formalism of gravity, the notation will be on the left side. Now, it takes a bit of getting used to because, well, first of all, I think having tensors takes some getting used to, having all the indices. But then writing things in an abstract way also requires a little bit of getting used to. So <clears throat> just to say a little bit more about this. So we often write t mu when we mean a vector. So we're, and, I, and I'm going to be doing that in the sort of, you know, later part of the course. But strictly speaking, <coughs> strictly speaking, the vector is an operator. So the T mu's here, these are the components of the vector in a particular basis. And so <clears throat> I think this, if, if you find yourself getting <clears throat> a little bit confused in this first bit of the course, this will be the source of the confusion I'm predicting. Um, and it's because our vector really is this <clears throat> complete geometric object, right? When we write down T mu, what we've done is we've split it up into components along particular coordinate axes. So writing T mu as we do is we find that we can do it quite consistently as long as we park the geometric picture and leave it behind. And then we go to the coordinate picture and, and then we stick with it and we follow the sets of rules for the indices and we're fine. So this is called... Um, abstract index notation. Or AIN. <clears throat> and basically Penrose kind of probably because he was used to interfacing with genuine pure mathematicians, um, <clears throat> realized that what they might think of as being sloppy was actually an extremely useful technique when you had to really calculate something rather than just talking about it. And so he, sorry, <laughs> don't worry, I've got plenty of pure math friends. Um, but, you know, this, so he kind of found a way of making this sort of rigorous in a sense of saying, well, really this is what we're doing when we write this down. So I'll, we'll, I'll try and sort of point that out as we, as we come across it, sort of over the next couple of lectures. But in the end, I'm going to leave it behind and we're just going to go forward with this abstract index notation. But it also kind of raises the question about bases, which is something, again, that I think can take a bit of time to, to get on board. But um, in this case... In this case, what I've done implicitly is constructed a basis. We have a vector space, the tangent space, TP of M. I construct a basis at the point P. 
So my basis here is called the coordinate basis. And so the idea is that if this is a sort of region of my manifold, this is my uh, R to the N, I'm looking here at, say, x1, <clears throat> let me make it just R squared, x1 and x2. These are, if you like, the, the images or pre-images of my coordinate axes. So here, this is x1, this is x2. And so they're curves on the manifold, the coordinate line at the x and the y, which will be all sort of squiggly because it's a curved manifold. But here, my coordinate basis is now the tangent vector of the x1 line and the tangent vector of the x2 line. And of course, I've constructed that at the point P, but I can construct it throughout the chart because my coordinates are defined on the chart. So that gives me a basis, not just at a point, but in the whole region where those coordinates are defined. So this sort of, sort of spills out into giving me a basis on the tangent bundle, or at least a region of the tangent bundle. So that's one basis that's extremely useful. In fact, it's usually what we, when we're doing GR with abstract index notation, we are almost always doing it in the coordinate basis. But another basis that's useful <clears throat> is the orthonormal basis where we choose some set of vectors, I'm just going to call them EA, and the idea there is if we have a metric, then the metric, if we take the dot product in that sense, defined by our metric, then it's, exact, it's either plus or minus one. So I realize I don't think I mentioned that the space of co-vectors, naughty, naughty, is called T star of M, T P star of M at the point and T star of M for the bundle. So our metric is simply taking two vectors and giving us a number which is either the sort of representing the angle between them or the magnitude, the length of the vector. So if we have a metric, an orthonormal basis is one where we have unit lengths for our vectors. So as an example in R3, orthonormal basis in spherical polars would look like that. So that's the spherical polars, R theta phi. So that would be our orthonormal basis. And our coordinate basis would just be d by dr d by d theta, d by d phi. So 
So this is sometimes called, if you're in four dimensions, a tetrad, a fearbine, fieldbine, whatever. This is the this this we're going to come back to this where we start to look at the differential structure on the manifold. But that's just like a first pass at. Uh, <clears throat> at what a basis is. So, sort of moving towards differential structure on manifolds, I'd just like to talk, sort of introduce differential uh, forms or uh, exterior derivatives. So, a form, roughly speaking, So a form is a completely anti-symmetric tensor and it lies in the uh, co-vector, so it's, it's basically lying as a co-tensor, right? And the reason why we want to think about forms is simply that when we try and take a derivative of a vector, we sort of often find that it's, there are pieces that don't kind of allow us to make, take a derivative of a vector and get a tensor, and those pieces are symmetric. So this is sort of the rationale. So here, So I'm just going to start sort of by thinking about a relation between functions and co-vectors. If I have a function on the manifold, I can, in a local chart, construct this object. I take the der partial derivative of the function along each coordinate line. And then here, this dx mu is like the equivalent <coughs> of d by dx mu, but now as a co-vector. So this is the sense in which I'm thinking of dx mu. It's a map, remember, from vectors down to the reals. And so here is a vector, which is the coordinate basis vector, d by dx nu. So when I say what is, you know, my, if I look up to seeing what my map is, omega of v, um, it's taking my vector, d by dx nu, um, and it's so we've got dx mu by dx mu here. And so this gives me 0 if mu does not equal nu and 1 if mu equals nu. So this is this is like a, a basis for the covector space. But it's also because it has this property of being zero unless it meets, its, meets itself, um, it's called the dual basis. So let me define my, what, actually, let me start my new board.
So to build P-forms, we take anti-symmetric tensor products. So we say that if A and B <coughs> are members of the dual space at P, then A wedge B, just gone and, sorry, I said I would use omega, let's call it lambda. then omega wedge lambda is equal to omega tensor lambda minus lambda tensor omega. So the wedge product simply says take your tensor, at least of two uh, rank one uh, forms, covectors, says take the first tensor the second minus the second tensor the first. So you're anti-symmetrizing your tensor product. So if I were to use the components, if omega, well, I, now I'm going to go to A and B, since I'm using P forms. If A is a P form, B is a Q form, In terms of the components, what it means is you just bung the two things together and anti-symmetrize, you know, the... I've got to watch language because it's being recorded, this, isn't it? I was thinking of that line in uh, The Martian. But anyway. Um... <clears throat> so you just anti-symmetrize away. So this is this idea of the forms being totally anti-symmetric. So this wedge product is not, it's not sort of entirely anti-commutative because it depends on how many indices A or B have. Because if you swap the ordering of A and B here, what you're doing is you're kind of pulling every single index of the B through every single index of the A. So if A or B is an even rank form, that is an operation that you're doing an even number of times. And so since this anti-symmetry carries a minus sign depending on the permutation of these indices, if you do something an even number of times, you get a plus sign. So the wedge product is, is sort of um, anti-commutative, but with a proviso. It depends on the rank of the forms. The other thing to note is that you can't have a form whose rank is bigger than the dimension of the manifold. This is kind of easy to see looking here at the anti-symmetry. If you had n plus 1 indices, it's totally anti-symmetric. So you go along and you go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right? You get up to n. Each one has to be, the value of each one has to be different from all the others because of the anti-symmetry. So you then get up to the nth index, and you've used all your degrees of freedom up. So you put another one in. It's bound to be the same, or a linear combination of what precedes it. So you can only go up to rank n, if n is the dimension of n,
and this rank n form is actually unique up to a factor. And so you have this notion of the anti-symmetric, the, the sort of permutation symbol. So it's uh, dependent. At least in four dimensions, it's going to be a four-index object. And it's just going to be plus or minus one dependent on whether the indices are an odd or an even permutation that's the wrong one, of 0, 1, 2, 3. So this epsilon tensor, it's strictly speaking, not really a te what I've written down, the plus or minus one thing, is strictly speaking not actually a tensor per se, it's what we call a tensor density, which means that under a coordinate transformation it sort of picks up um, sort of extra factors dependent on the determinant of the coordinate transformation. So. <clears throat> Let me just have a brief aside on coordinate transformations. So coordinate transformations are what happens when you have overlapping charts. So the geometric vector t, which is the tangent to a curve, doesn't care what the underlying chart is, but the t mu, the components of t, do care. So by simply writing down what we mean by our vector in our coordinate basis, uh, we can see that under a coordinate transformation, we have this relation t prime mu primed is t mu times the uh, coordinate transformation between the two, two charts. So this is also sometimes how you may see vectors defined. It's also how vectors transform under a coordinate transformation. And so similarly, if I transform my covector, then I get a similar relation. So 
Under coordinate transformations, components of vectors and covectors change, and they change in a specific way related to the matrix that is the differential matrix that tells you how to go between coordinate systems. What happens to our epsilon tensor? So if I were to construct from this uh, permutation symbol, if I'm sort of thinking, well, I want to construct a four form, which is one of these geometric objects. So what do I do? I take the components and I now, um, this is obviously n equals four here. Uh, I take the components and I contract them with a basis. So this is what I'm doing here. But if I make a change of basis, So if I do a change of basis here, this dx mu comes the partial derivative of dx mu by dx prime mu prime. So I do that for each of my uh, basis elements. So that's how I get to here. This is actually just the same thing as this because it's just defined as plus or minus one. But the, if you take this permutation symbol with a matrix, so you say you take epsilon ABC contract it with a matrix MAA prime, MBB prime, MCC prime in three dimensions, that's the definition of determinant. The determinant of a matrix is given by a set of permutations sort of of the different elements and multiplying them together. It's the determinant. So here we pick up the determinant of dx by dx prime multiplied by what looks like the same thing. So if I wanted to construct a tensor, So this is me trying to construct an end form. I find that it doesn't quite work. I sort of almost get the same components, but I get a factor of the determinant. So this is the definition of a density. But I'd prefer to have an actual tensor rather than having this pesky factor floating around. And I can do that if I have a metric. So how do I do that? Well, if I think about the metric and think about it in components, I'm looking for the determinant of the components that g mu nu in some given basis. So if I ask what is, happens under a coordinate transformation, well, that g prime of mu prime nu prime is equal to det of dx mu by dx mu primed, dx nu by dx primed, nu primed, uh, g mu nu, which is the determinant of dx by dx primed, 
squared debt G. So debt of G primed is equal to debt G times the square of the determinant of dx by dx prime. So I simply define So notice the, the font here, an actual font. Curly epsilon is the one that's the tensor. <coughs> sort of bare epsilon is the So as soon as you've added in that uh, volume, this, this factor, the, the determinant of G, you find that your epsilon with that volume factor becomes now a proper tensor. This also enables us to define maps between different dimensionalities of p-forms, and this is called the Hodge dual. So it maps a p-form to an n minus p-form. We call this, we write it as a going to star a, and in components, Sorry, this is probably not very visible, so let me just read it out. So the dual of, of P form A, which has n, it's now an n minus P form, you take the epsilon tensor, you contract P of its indices with A, and you're left with n minus P indices. So that's giving you a dual of a P form as an n minus P form. So with this information, we can then actually define a derivative that takes us through the p form. So, although for reasons that you've seen in the original GR course, to define the derivative of a generic vector, you have to kind of think about how to do it, you usually have to add extra structure onto your space time. With forms, you can actually define a derivative, a covariant derivative that works without having a metric necessarily. So just to finish off, Our derivative is a map, which we call D, that takes us from P forms to P plus 1 forms, and it satisfies three conditions. This is sufficient, actually, to define it. So D reduces to this DF on functions, so function is like a zero form. D also has a Leibnizian property.
So remember Leibnizian means if you're taking a derivative of fg, it's the derivative of f times g plus f times the derivative of g. This is the same thing, but there's a little minus sign depending on the rank of a. And then the third condition is that if you perform this differentiation twice, you get zero. So these three conditions are actually sufficient to pin down what this d is. So in components, In components, you simply take the partial derivative of your form and then again anti-symmetrize like crazy. So we'll be coming back to it tomorrow, but if you remember, when you try and take the derivative of, say, a, a covector just by using partial differentiation and look at what happens under a coordinate transformation, you find that you don't get a cotensor you get something that looks like what you want, but then you get an extra piece, which is a second derivative of the coordinate transformation. So it's, say, um, d squared x by dx prime dx prime, and it's symmetric. This, by anti-symmetrizing, kills off that symmetric part. So that's, if you like, a, a rather mundane way of saying it. It's a bit sort of nuts and boltsy but it's a way of seeing why it works. However, mathematicians, when defining D, define it in this rather formal operator type of form. They say it's this map that's going from one, you know, one space to the next. It satisfies Leibnizian properties. It reduces to D on functions, and D squared is zero, and that's actually enough to fully specify what this exterior derivative D is. Okay, so um, that sort of... Uh, at the end of our preliminary bit of revision. Uh, tomorrow we'll take on up this theme again of derivations and we'll talk about the Lie derivative. That's the, that's the plan.